Joining us now, a great guest, Richard Hanania, old friend of the show. He's the president of the CSPI Center, fellow at Defense Priorities, longtime friend and uh, somebody that we turn to for insight. Richard, thanks for joining us, man. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Richard, you've been one of the most, I think, clairvoyant voices on this. I see a lot of people out there saying, oh, Joe Biden could have done more. We should have planned more for an exit from Afghanistan. How is this all a complete mess? What would have that actually entailed, Richard? What were our actual options in Afghanistan to try and mitigate the disaster that we see before us right now? Yeah, I mean, the war was such a, you know, a, such a terrible disaster. And there's so many anecdotes you could pick from to just sort of demonstrate that point. But one of my favorites, and maybe the thing that stands out to me most, is in 2018, uh, 60 Minutes, Lara Logan uh, went to Afghanistan and they talked to the top general there. And what he basically told her was the U.S. had not secured the road between the U.S. embassy and the airport. Uh, that's about a two mile road. It's a straight it's a straight line. And they had to travel by helicopter. I mean, these are the two most important places, you know, the Kabul airport and the US embassy. And so I think that people, what they really don't understand is that the US is massively incompetent. We can't do anything in Afghanistan. We spent trillions of dollars. The entire government was a, was a phantom. It didn't exist. It had control over maybe a few buildings, uh, maybe a few uh, you know parts of a few provincial capitals and cities, but there really was no government to, to actually speak of. Uh, so the US is getting out. When the US gets out, a lot of people are going to want to come with. Even when, even during peacetime, a lot of people want to leave Afghanistan. A lot of people would take a trip to the U.S. if they could. So even if you th theoretically got out every, uh, you know, every Afghan translator, everybody who worked with the United States, uh, that's difficult. I mean, there's legal hurdles. Uh, the, you know, there's 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 laws that the administration has to uh, has to live under and, and work with. Uh, even if you did that, the airport would get swamped. Now the U.S can't drive to the airport right it has to go to it has to go there to a helicopter so you 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 know this this is what people are seeing they're seeing the uh they're seeing the uh scenes from the airport where the afghans crowding there and you what you have to believe is that the us who could not do anything in 20 years of in afghanistan if it stayed for a few more months it would have competently run the kabul airport uh under the most desperate conditions imaginable that, that that's what the warhawks are saying that's what they're saying give us a few more months and this would have happened and it would have been somewhat of a of a of a clean withdrawal. Biden already uh, delayed the withdrawal. Uh Trump, admit, Trump had a deal that said we were going to leave in May. Biden uh, delayed it and people were wondering why Biden was delaying it. Was this just a plan to stay long term or was it that what Biden actually said uh, that there was logistical problems and that basically the Trump administration didn't cooperate and they needed like more time to work it out. Uh, since that time, I mean, I think we've seen pretty clearly that Biden actually does want to get out. So I think the uh, most um, most reasonable assumption is that he was telling the truth at the time that they were actually trying. Um, and this was the best that they can do. This was probably the best any administration could do because mm -hmm. we just have to learn our limits. I think people haven't realized that they just think, oh, we could have done a little bit better. Oh, plan the evacuation better, you know, fight the insurgency a little bit better, give it a little more time. These are the same arguments we've seen throughout the wars, throughout the war. And, uh, you know, a couple months, a couple years, I mean, as the Biden administration is saying, would not have made a difference. There was just, it was just time to get out. Right. Yeah, I mean, what we're seeing right now is not an indictment so much as the of the Biden administration as it is all of the hawks, all of the neocons, all of the administrations that were happy to push this to the next president, push this to the next president. That's the real indictment. The, the hawks that you're referring to, I mean, the fact that they got it so incredibly wrong and were happy to lie to people time and time again, and now we're supposed to listen to them is completely absurd to me, ultimately. What the Biden administration has been arguing is basically like, Look, if we had stayed longer, as you all are saying, and planned, taken time to plan better, get more of our people out, we would have found ourselves in the middle of a hot civil war. Could you just unfold what that scenario, what that alternative that many, many, many are advocating for now, what that would have actually looked like? Yeah, I mean, it's incredible. I mean, the, the the arguments that are being made. So Adam Kinzinger was on uh, Twitter and he was saying, uh, we had a lot more troops 10 years ago and uh, we haven't taken a casualty, you know, in a year, in a year and a half or something like that. And so, this, you know, things were getting better. And everyone knows that the reason that we weren't, or hopefully everyone knows, enough people know that the reason we weren't taking casualties uh, was that the Taliban had reached a deal with the Trump administration. What was going on when the U.S. wasn't taking casualties? Well, the Taliban was making gains. You can go look at the maps 
what was happening uh, month by month, year by year. Um, and so they actually, you know, so Kinziger comes and now turns it around and says, this is this is a sign of progress. I mean, it's a joke. And so if you stayed, what would you, what situation you would be in now is that basically you're under, you're, you're in worse shape than you ever were. I mean, the, the, you know, the arguments don't ever change. It's always give us a few more months. Uh, Pompeo says, make it conditions based. Con- conditions based <laughs> is basically an argument of people who never want to leave. The entire point of this war, the entire point of why, uh, the, the entire point of understanding how incompetent we've been is that conditions are never good. That's why it's such a disaster. Uh, and so things weren't going to get better. The only thing that's actually, if there's any, cons- if there's anything that's changing over time, is that our position is getting worse. And we've tried a lot. I mean, we had the the uh, the Bush administration, a more of a hands off approach, went into Iraq. That was people criticized that. You know, it was actually more stable under the Bush administration. Obama comes in and he's uh, boxed in by the generals. He he uh, sends a troop surge, over 100,000 troops. Violence goes up. Uh, the 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 government starts the the money just you know goes into the pockets of of the warlords it fuels corruption uh, American deaths go up uh, Afghan civilian deaths go up the government loses uh, the government loses territory Trump comes in he sends in he again sends in more troops he ups the bombing campaign so it's it's a completely different strategy it's not coin uh, counterinsurgency like Obama with uh, boots on the ground as much it's just bombing from the air the Afghan the uh, Taliban gains more territory so it's like the harder you try the worse it gets the only consistency is we keep failing. Um, and we keep failing consistently, and they're, you know, they're, the hawks are always there saying just a little bit more time. I mean, I'm right. glad we finally. I mean, this is, you know, there's, uh, you see these things reoccurring, and I've been watching this for years, and it's refreshing to see a president who just came in and said no more. I mean, this is political courage, and I think everyone should acknowledge that. I, we've been saying the same thing all day. This is the most presidential thing I've ever seen. I've never respected Joe Biden more um, than for standing up against the media and saying, no, I'm absolutely not going to bow down. I want to drill down into that, Richard. I keep hearing this constantly. Oh, well, Sagar, we, you didn't know we haven't lost a soldier there since February of 2020. Yeah, because we have a peace deal. So let's go through this. We violate the peace deal. We say we're going to take six more months or whatever in order to evacuate our people. What happens, Richard? What What is the actual, like, what, what is the policy consequence of that? It is dead American soldiers, is it not? Uh, yeah, I mean, look, yeah, we had the peace deal. We didn't take any casualties, but we also lost more and more territory for the Afghan government. So I guess right. you could have ended up a situation where uh, you could leave troops there, and then the U.S. You know, you just lose more and more territory, and then what's going to happen? You know, so that it's a uh, the conditions are are even worse. <laughs> They'll come back and say uh, it's good. We need, you know, we're for withdrawal. We're conditions based for withdrawal. We can't leave under this humiliating circumstances. Uh, the, you know, it's, it just gets you know the the you know it's on a downward slope, and it's all has been on a downward slope. Um, and so, yeah, you have to, I mean, the Afghan government, I mean, did not exist on paper. We, They were telling us 20 years ago, 10 years ago, five years ago, uh, they're turning the corner. We're seeing great progress. They collapsed. I mean, Vietnam, people make the comparison to Vietnam. The South Vietnamese government lasted lasted two years after the United States fell. The uh, the, 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 yeah. the government left behind by in Afghanistan by the Soviets uh, lasted, for, lasted for a while. Uh, this was even before we were out the door, and it wasn't like heavy fighting. It was just, uh, it was, it was just a complete collapse. What's uh, well, very interesting when the Taliban was trying to take Mazar Sharif, which is a, a large northern city in Afghanistan, the Afghan uh, government wasn't even fighting. It was actually the militias, uh, Dastu militia, and uh, and other and then other militias that that were there. If you read the history of Afghanistan, these are the same names that were fighting the Soviets in the 1980s, yep. um, and they were there. They were there. They were part of the Northern Alliance when the U.S. invaded. So you have this 20 years, right? And then the U.S. Uh, just you know it, it puts in this ungodly amount of money, and the result is like you know it's not just they lose to the Taliban. It's like the, the Afghan government is probably not even the second or third best fighting force in the country. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you know they just they just melt away these militias. You know they can't take on the Taliban either. They actually they're in a weaker state than they were when the U.S. invaded. The, you know the militias held off the Taliban for a while in the in the 1990s. It's just such an indication of what a disaster you know this has been. I don't know if you could have screwed this up worse if you tried to fail. I mean these the, we just have to stop listening to these people. They're, you know there's no hope of them ever getting it right and we need to deeply reflect on how how things got to this point. What do you make of the fact, we played the sound here that's been passed around of Biden, you know, a little more than a month ago saying like, you know, we have three, they've got 300,000 Afghan army fighters and it's not like the Taliban is just going to come in and overrun the place immediately. Clearly that turned out to be totally wrong. Um, Was 
Was he lied to? Was the military just wildly off in their estimates? Why do you think that they were so wrong about their projections of how long it would take? They, they kind of knew the Taliban was likely to take over, yeah. but in the length of time it would take and this just utter collapse that we've witnessed. Yeah, I mean, I think if we're going to say there was one mistake Biden made, it was promising too much from the uh, from the Afghan government. Look, these things are very, very hard to forecast. Uh, so uh, the Metaculus is a sort of a website where people go and they predict what's going to happen. And they gave it about a 50% chance that the Taliban would take uh, the presidential palace by 2026. I was on Twitter. I said by 2026, it's probably a 70 or 80% chance. So I would say, you know, the Taliban's eventually going to win. Um, and I said over 50% chance this year. So, you know, nobody, nobody can forecast these things, you know, the, the intelligence agencies, the military, they pretend to be uh, scientific. I, I feel pretty good about my prediction. I was more pessimistic about the Afghan government than most people, uh, but there's nowhere way to know for sure. The bottom line is they're incompetent. It, it was much worse than people uh, thought. They were losing territory while they had the U.S. there supporting them. Um, you can imagine what it does to morale. You know, you're losing territory with the U.S. The U.S. is leaving. It's not, you know, hard to see like the psychological effect of that. So what Biden should have said was, I mean, he should have probably Probably lowered expectations. He probably, you know, was listening to his military and listening to uh, the CIA, the CIA. They, you know, they, I'm sure they weren't telling him, uh, you know, they weren't telling him the Afghan government was going to last forever. But maybe they thought it would be like South Vietnam. Maybe they thought it would be six months to a year. We poured all this money, we poured all this arms into there, and he should have just taken a more agnostic position on it. I think his messaging has been good, but that was a, a major mistake, and people will, of course, hold it against him. Yeah, I think you know, I, I think this is the most important point around the actual capability of the military. And this is what, you know, Richard, you've tracked this for a long time, but something I can't help but notice is these people had 18 months to ensure a withdrawal from Afghanistan. They know they were gonna do this since February of 2020. Why did they screw it up so badly? This is not just under Joe Biden, this is on the same military under Donald Trump. Yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, yeah, that that's what being incompetent means. I mean, you, you have a lot of time, <laughs> you have a lot of resources, and you keep failing, and you could do another, you know, 18 months. I mean, Biden, I think, you know, I think they thought it was going to be a complete disaster if they just took to the May 1st date. So all, all the government was doing on Afghanistan was preparing for uh, leaving for three, four months, and they screwed it up. Who knows, if they left in May, maybe it would have been uh, uh, 10 times worse. Um, but yeah, there, there are deep problems in the system. It's, it's not the Biden administration. I I think the Biden administration did you know, the most you can hope for uh, realistically from the American government at this point, which is just stop investing uh, lives, stop uh, stop wasting money on this and just, you know, move, moving on. I, I think rip, that's pretty- Rip the bandaid off. Yeah. Um, let me ask you, Richard, finally about the politics of this, uh, which are interesting. Uh, Alex Thompson retweeted a tweet from Don Jr. in the months before the election, which said, a vote for Joe Biden is a vote for forever war in the Middle East. A vote for Donald Trump is a vote to finally bring our troops home. And he links to a Breitbart piece with Mike Pompeo talking yeah. about being on a pathway to achieve zero U.S. forces in Afghanistan by spring 2021. Haven't seen those folks really giving Biden any credit here for doing what Trump promised and ultimately failed over his four years to do. Yeah, I mean, I made a joke on Twitter a few days ago um, that they were going to reinvent Trump as an Afghan feminist. And I thought it was a joke <laughs> at the time. And, and they start doing it. I mean, so, so you have Hugh Hewitt, I mean, saying that this is Biden's failure. And then you have, you know, it's like, okay, that's neocons. They, they want to stay anyway. So they want to claim the Trump legacy. And then Stephen Miller comes and does the same thing. And Don Jr. comes and does the same thing. Uh, yeah, they're, they're, they're pretty shameless and they're going to try to make hay out of it. I mean, the, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens. I, I always uh, said that the, uh, the politics of this is the only way, like, you know, we have pretty short memories. I mean, who remembers Hong Kong and Belarus? I mean, now, I mean, these were big right. stories not that long ago. People have short memories. The only way it would matter for the midterms or for the 2024 election is if the U.S. was still there and still taking casualties. This looks bad. It may be to look bad for a month, maybe two months, maybe three months. Uh, but we're still, you know, over a year away from even the midterm elections. And I think long term Biden probably made the right choice. I think you're absolutely right. Richard, really appreciate your analysis on all of this. You've been, uh, I think it's a very useful counter to a lot of what people are hearing out there in the mainstream media. And they need to hear the actual truth which is right here. So thanks for joining us, man. Appreciate thanks, it. Thanks, Richard. Good to see you. My pleasure. Thank you. Good to see you.
Thanks, everybody, for watching. I missed you all so terribly. <laughs> we missed um, you too, Sagar. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, you guys can become a premium subscriber today. You can help support the work that we do here. Uh, the link is right down there in the description. You get the show an hour early. Listen to it, all of that. Your support is what makes it possible for us to offer you the actual counter to the mainstream media narrative in Afghanistan and more. I, I have never felt that our show is more important than at times like now. Yeah. When there's a single uniform voice out there in the establishment about what needs to be done. And nobody seems to be standing up for the actual soldiers themselves, for the Afghans, for anybody yeah. um, who is just left behind by this like colossal warmongering Or narrative. just the truth. Yeah, I mean, I mean just tell on, the truth. This is one of those days where you could turn on Fox All News yeah. or CNN or MSNBC and you'd hear some Same version thing, yeah. of the same damn thing. So um, thank you guys for making it possible for us to do what we do here, which is just literally try to be honest about the way you've been yeah. lied to and about the reality that's facing you and people around the world. We are incredibly grateful for you. And that's we're right. grateful to have you back, too. Thank so you. Thank you. Back. I miss you, miss you terribly. All right. <laughs> we will see you all on Tuesday. See you all tomorrow. Hey guys, thanks so much for watching. That's right. Just as a reminder, you can become a premium subscriber today. Watch the full show completely uncut. Our reactions to each other's monologues. You get to listen to it. You get to ask us questions. All that good stuff. Link is right there in the description or at breakingpoints.com. Best of all, great way to say screw you to the mainstream media.